Okay, we're gonna do okay, we're gonna do a do over in here. So whatever I told you a while ago, I'm gonna say it again, but this time with the with this one over here. So that's my Twitter account over here. I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we're gonna have. Okay. So we're ready? Yeah. All right, perfect. Okay, let's do take two here. Hi, everybody. Hi. How's everybody doing so far? Good, good. It's been a long day, but I hope that uh, our conversation for today will really be you know, um, instructive to you and to your projects. My name is Jem Rosario. I am a user experience specialist here in Toronto. And as you've heard in my uh, mini spiel a while ago, Today we're going to be talking about design discovery, which is really that first mile in the design process. And we have already gone through some really great sessions on how to operationalize um, uh, design discovery and user research. And today I'm just going to be showing you that framework, that founding framework that hopefully will help you um, get really acting upon uh, discovering the project context, the problem to solve, and most importantly, aligning it to what, what you, to what your users and your business needs with respect to the project that you're building. Sounds good? All right. So you've heard this ready, but I'm gonna say it again, because you know, I'm too much of a creature of habit. The first few days of pretty much any new project is typically exciting. The client is here, the executives are excited, the team has been assembled, and we are just ready to take this ship on the road. Okay? But then somehow, somewhere, a UX designer pipes up, probably at the back of the room, and says, we should do UX research. We really need to discover the right problem to solve so that we can build the best digital product or service for our client and their users. So, that's supposed to be a good thing, right? So absolutely aligning everything, making all the ducks in a row in one line, and you know, that's supposed to be a good thing. Building everything according to spec, according to plan, and most importantly, according to what your users needs, right? It's supposed to be a good thing. So then how are you gonna be explaining, or how do you start to explain the confusion some teams have when it comes to doing project discovery or UX research, or worse, the resistance that some teams have when it comes to this process. Today, we are going to talk about good design discovery by way of effective UX research. My intention is to provide you with this starter framework to really get this process on the road so that you can build digital products that people love. So here's our agenda for today. Here's our agenda for today. I'm going to begin with a little intro on what design discovery is, what's its intention really be, and then we're going to go through the design discovery jetpack, which is really this collection of, um, of methodologies that you could use, mix and match, in order to really build that targeted discovery process. And then we're going to be finishing with some special concerns and questions in design discovery, and then we're going to be wrapping up from there. Does that sound like a plan? All right. So design discovery is that first mile in the design process. This is where we try to understand the design problem at hand in order to table a strong and solid solution. It is composed typically that design process of a double diamond, it's typically conceived as a double diamond, where on the, right, on the left side, you've got product definition and on the right side, you've got product execution. And there are some things that we do within the process to really inform both the definition and the execution phases, all to make sure that we are really building the best thing for our users and that design discovery happens between initial insight and the plan. So how many of you are familiar with this model, the double diamond model of design? Raise your hands. So this is a model from the... Um, from the if I'm not mistaken, it's from, the British, um, it's from the British Design Council, I believe. I may be getting the, uh, the facts wrong, but it's definitely from, um, from the UK. And the intention of that double diamond is to really just provide um, a map of the things that happen within a typical design process, such as 
you begin with that initial insight like I have a problem that I want to solve or I have a big idea and how am I going to be following through that from a very very strategic um, from a very strategic standpoint as in the first diamond and then once you've come up with a plan you are now going to be moving on to the execution phase which is really in, in, in Drupal parlance is really where um, development kicks in. So how many among you here can really say that they are, um, that they are um, user experience practitioners? Raise their hands. None? So I'd like to have a show of hands. So could you just give me a sense of uh, who, um, who and what uh, you're working on in your respective companies? Any takers? Mm hmm Yep. Front end design. Front end design. Okay. Anybody else? All right. So in 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 summary, the point of uh, the point of this double diamond is to provide that that um, that initial map towards the process, and we just really want to zero in on that first on that first diamond in the process because that's really where all the design discovery all the planning all the user research that's really where that's really where it all happens and i'm going to go through and i'm going to go through um those methodologies um, um, in a short while but but have a look at that first diamond and and all the activities that go on in there such as understanding the market customer empathy product strategy ideation etc cetera, etc cetera. Right? The goal of product definition is to make that plan really concrete. You want it to make it very, very solid so that you know what to do the moment you try to bring it from idea all the way to execution. Okay? So that's the double diamond in a nutshell. And let's now move on to the second phase in this presentation, which is how do we really conduct this effective discovery phase? When it comes to really doing this um, discovery phase, what usually comes to my mind is, okay, we're now on some kind of a fact-finding mission, hence that Inspector Closo thing at the beginning of my presentation. And it's really all about understanding what problem you have at this point and how you're going to be setting the, setting the cycle in motion to really understand the challenge that you've got in a very targeted way. So by using the term jetpack in the design discovery jetpack, what I'm really referring to here is the right set of UX research methods to get discovery done. And when I say the right set, I'm, I'm not just simply referring to the appropriate um, methodologies, but also the right scale of, um, of methods. Because one of the biggest temptations, for some teams at least, is that you're stockpiling way too much on, um, on, on, U, on UX research methods such that it starts becoming a little bit too bulky, there's too much to process, there's too much data that has to be, uh, it has to be dealt with. But at least when you're trying to be a little bit more lean, trying to be a little bit more actionable, um, there's probably something to be said about keeping it lean in the beginning and then when you find that you really want to scale up the, uh, the, the understanding of the problem at hand, like for example, if you discover something surprising about your customers or your business um, halfway, halfway down the road, you would be able to course correct and actually follow through on those surprise, surprising insights. So. The most important thing when it comes to really understanding any kind, of, uh, any kind of process that you will be reading, whether it is through someone like Don Norman or Jared Spool or, or, uh, or some guy or girl on medium.com, is that the process that they tend to advocate worked for them. And the same disclaimer is also applying here, such that the process that you're going to see worked for me in the sense that this is really a reflection of the patterns, the methodological patterns that I have uh, had throughout my time as a UX practitioner. But in order for you to really get the biggest bang for your design bug, for your strategy bug, you want to make sure that the methods that you see in here, you're thinking about them and you're trying to tailor fit them according to your process. That's the best way to make sure that you're ensuring the long-term success of the product or service that you're building. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing within the next few slides. So far, so good? Are we going on a pretty good pace? Not too fast, not too slow, but just right? All right, amazing. So usually, 
I find that there are three big ticket stages when it comes to doing uh, when it comes to doing project discovery. There's client side research where you try to understand everything there is to know about your business, about your client, and then you move on to user research, which is really now all about okay, um, we now know what the business needs. We now know what they really wanted to achieve with this new website project that they're trying to do. Well, who are they really deciding for? So this is where um, this is where user research is really going to be of biggest help. This is where we quote unquote get out of the building to really understand who is it that we're designing for. And then once we've done all those um, all those processes, the first step and the second step, we are now going to be taking everything that we know and start presenting it to our clients and stakeholders and say. It. This is what we've learned. This is now we can. This is how we can start solving the problem through um, through emphasis synthesis, whether it is internal synthesis or collaborative synthesis with your team. So that's the twenty thousand feet point of view of doing design discovery, and I'm now going to begin with that first big ticket phase called client side research. Client side research, as we've already uh, hinted a while ago, is really all about understanding what your clients or your business really absolutely needs. We do it because we want to probe your project's business context so we know what to optimize for, for example, or design with this new product or service offering. And usually I find that with websites, especially websites for e-commerce or something, the typical, the typical objective is, okay, well, we want to be able to increase sales, to optimize conversion, etc., etc. Those kinds of business goals are what we try to get a good handle on as early as possible during this client-side research thing. And there are some activities that we do in order to really get that thing, uh, get thing done. So before I continue, is everybody familiar with the list of activities that I have over here? Are, are you more or less um, uh, familiar with these methodologies? Is there anything that you want me to elaborate a little bit more in detail? It's more about me being mindful of time, that's why. Or should I, or should I talk through everything? Who has a preference? Talk through everything. Raise your hand. Selective. Raise their hands. Okay. Um, okay. Let's go. Let's, let's try to uh, let's try to go for both. How many of you want? How many of you want to know about stakeholder interviews? All right. Let's, let's just go through everything. Stakeholder interviews. This is really now. This is really about. Okay. This is the first meeting with your client. This is the first interaction that you've got with them. And therefore, okay, what do they really stand for? What is their brand all about? What is their business? What do they really want to achieve as a result of um, engaging with you as a vendor or as a service provider? And then as soon as you have that good first, um, first interaction with them, you build some more relationships with them and try to understand what their business is all about. To which then you move into competitive analysis, which is now about understanding, okay, so this is this business over here. There's probably some other related businesses that, um, that, they, are, uh, that they are competing with, that they're also in the, in the ecosystem with. So for example, um, so for example in, the case of, uh, in the case of Google, there's got to be another there's got to be another company that produces uh, produces browsers. So Google, Farfa, Mozilla, okay, and the rest you can definitely name them. And by doing competitive analysis, you're really essentially trying to find the good, the bad, the ugly, the, the and and many other and many other stuff that would help really inform what are the things that really work for them, what are the things that cannot work, what are the things that we can take away from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's competitive analysis. And then heuristic evaluation is really now this more structured process in which there are, there are some usual usability standards that we want to take, take into consideration. Is the product that we have really up to par, at least during that initial, uh, initial scan in the usability standards? And then you also do primary and secondary research, which is trying to understand um, uh, the people within the company and also are there any kinds of uh, uh, literature available what was the press that this company has had before and then you also dig in through analytics just to really get a good feel of um, what their website traffic is especially in the case of websites content audits which is really that list of all the of all the content pieces that the company has and then finally metrics 
which will come organically through um, the conversations that you will have with your clients because they will tell you, okay, we're going through this, um, this project because we want to optimize for X. We want to increase Y, etc., etc. So far, so good. Secondly, as soon as you've done all that business side research, you now go on through user research, which is now really about the people that you are designing for. And the selection of activities that you're seeing over here, this is really just a subsection of a very, very, very um, rich field uh, called user research. And I'm just really going to show you over here the, um, the big ticket items that tend to happen in my practice at least when I, uh, when I help clients um, build websites. So for example, you've got personas. Okay, personas, which is really that, um, that uh, composite um, picture of your users. And I've put a very important qualifier there, which is scenario-driven personas. Because at least in my, in my view, the big problem with some personas is that they tend to be just a laundry list of demographics and, and, um, and bullet points. Rather, what we want to do is to drive that empathy piece and really answer within that persona document. Well, okay, Janet, what does Janet need from us? What is that relationship that we want to build with her? What is the thing that she needs from us as a company? And, and you know, how, how can we, as a, as a service-providing company, can address whatever it is that she really wants solved? So it is that, situationing, uh, it's that situational look at the people that you're designing for that really unlocks the potential of personas beyond just simply descriptors of this is Janet, she is 43 years old, she lives in Richmond Hill or, or something. Because you don't really get anything beyond that kind of thing, especially if you're trying to understand what is going on with her life that would want her to switch to our product or service, etc. Usability testing is meant to really just tease out uh, the initial, uh, initial challenges with the product or the service that you've got. Okay, so usually usability, usability testing tends to happen across the entire project lifecycle. On one hand, you, tend to do, you, you can do it as early as possible just to benchmark the challenges that you've got, what you have to work around with, etc., etc. And also you try to do usability testing throughout the development process just to really level set and benchmark. Um, okay, um, the issues that we have set before, we have identified before, Okay, they're starting to get solved right now. We're, not, we're, now, we're now getting really good clarity and good, um, good stuff in here. So usability testing is meant to really just benchmark the thing and also assess how it's, uh, how it's working through and through. And then card sorting and tree testing, those are information architecture techniques that you use to really understand, for example, well, what will that navigation structure really be? And usually, we're pretty much happy campers when we say home, about, this cool service offering, blog, contact us. That's a pretty simple um, IA structure. But as you and I know, especially if we're, if we're working with um, really big ticket clients, we know that it's definitely go beyond five major categories. So what will that categorization scheme really look like? And that's exactly the job of card sorting and tree testing. Job stories is from Clayton Christensen, where it's really all about what is the job that your uh, users are trying to get done. And we want to pay attention to that so that we can really design the product or the service according to that um, unique pain point that they want solved. And many other uh, research methodologies is needed. And finally, once you've gotten all those information, all those details, both from your users and from your business, you now want to start presenting what you know and get the process of solving the design problem really started. So in my world, it typically happens like, we now say to my clients, okay, here's what we've learned about you, a business, or the, the client, and here's also what we've learned from, our, from your users, and we want you to know that these are the things that matter to them. They really, they really appreciate, for example, the recipe pages that you put in this magazine website. They really love it if you do all these, um, all these contests, etc., etc. So we try to tell them that the good, the, the good and the bad, okay? I mean, we don't really say bad, as in bad, but we try to tell them what are the things that we can really improve on. And then... Once your client has really gotten a good feel for it, you can now start saying, okay, we can now start really thinking about what's the technical architecture? 
what might be the features that we really want this website or this mobile app to really have in the future. And then, how can we really operationalize in that? How can we really do good on that? And that's the job of your design documentation, whether it is a user flow document or wireframes. Maybe for some of you, you might even be creating an interactive prototype either through InVision or Axure or something. And then also some research presentations just to really say, these are the things that we've known about our users and this is exactly what we can do to solve their foremost challenges. Now, every project is different. There are some extra considerations that you want to uh, pay attention to, especially if you're now going a little bit beyond um, uh, content presentation. And this is especially the case for, uh, for websites uh, that tend to be a little bit more about the functionality, where you have to do something in order to really get the biggest bang for your buck. Like for example, if you're, uh, if you're a marketing company and you really want to drive lots more um, lead generation and, and a lot of uh, conversion for your, for your products and services, then that would really mean putting a little bit more effort on the discovery process, the methods that you really want to use. So I've given, you, um, I've given you some more activities that you could consider depending on the type of a, a, of a depending on the type of design practice, if you wish, that, um, that, that, you, that you're trying to really understand for. So for example, if it's information architecture, if you really want to understand the structure of the site, do more card sorting and tree testing. If you really need more user research, you've gotten some more um, methods there. Content strategy, here are some, uh, some initial discovery methods that could really work for you. And, and also visual design, there's also some mood boards, really trying to understand what is the visual style that we want to go for, what's the feel, what are the color schemes, the fonts that we want to use. And what I normally recommend is that it's very tempting to have just one user experience practitioner do all of this. Whenever possible, if it's possible to spread the competencies out, such as you've got a dedicated um, visual designer and then you've got a uh, that user experience designer slash information architect, or if you can even invest in a, in, in, in a content strategist, that would be fantastic because at least um, the, the load is shared among the team. But the point of having these add-on activities really just to um, say, okay, we can actually go a little bit more beyond the standard selection of a user research methods because our problem is a little bit more specific and therefore it may warrant extra, extra discovery, a little bit more methods just to really get to the problem at hand. Sounds good? Can someone remind me of the time? 10 after 4. 10 after 4. All right, perfect. So we're kind of on track, okay, which is a surprise considering that uh, we, uh, we, we started a little bit, uh, a little bit outside of schedule, but we're now here on the third and the most important part, which is really the thing that I'm excited for. In an ideal world, design discovery is going to be going smoothly. It's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be like full of, uh, full of drama or something. It's just going to go as straightforward as possible. But as we've seen a while ago, Design discovery really depends, the success of design discovery, that is, really depends on what would really be, um, what would really be the right methodologies to attack the problem that you've got. And therefore, we want to account for those specific instances within organizations, within clients, so that we could make sure that design discovery really happens in the most productive way possible. Our goal really is to make that process your own. And so let's begin with that first and really big ticket consideration called the relationship between UX and Agile. This is a minefield. Let's be clear. This is a minefield. In an ideal world, Agile and UX are going to play very well. In an ideal world, you would really have UX research and design really fit into that sprint schedule and there will be no issues. That sprint schedule that your product manager has worked so hard for, um, it's just going to go smoothly and, that, and everybody's just going to sing a happy tune because everything is just going to go as planned. But the problem, however, is that in a pure, strong, 
capital A, Agile process. Okay? The challenge is that UX research and design becomes shoehorned into the process. It gets forcibly fit in there, sacrificing the deep contextual thought that's really needed to do um, contextual user-centric um, user centric design. And I've got an example for you to really just make that, uh, make that a little bit more, uh, more tangible. So Yum Digital, an award-winning agency down, uh, down in Australia, Okay, kudos to them, they were able to make this UX and Agile thing work. Okay, as you can see over here, okay, if you look at feature A, that blue, uh, that blue dot over there, where, uh, where the start, uh, where the start um, blurb is, you can see it. Prototype, development, test, launch, sprint one, sprint two, sprint three, sprint, sprint four. It was just cascading pretty nice. Okay, they managed to make this thing work. Now, let's say, for example, that we are going to be turning down the, uh, the lights on this presentation. Have you noticed, why is research such a forlorn and lonely box over there at Sprint 1? Okay. So lonely. Okay. So lonely. What if by Sprint 3, you discover something new? What if you discover that there's, uh, there's, there's got to be a change in direction somewhere that you really need to account for? And so, is it the end of the world then? Okay? I mean, I'm pretty sure that it's not, but this is one of those conversations that UX designers and, ad and, and pure agilistas are having. Like, how do we really ensure that these, kinds of, uh, that these kinds of situations can be accounted for, especially if you discover something new and surprising for your, um, for your, for your users? And this is exactly the core of what Paige Lobheimer of the Nielsen Norman Group was saying, that a pure, strong, agile process Forces, um, forces designers to really be a little bit out of their element at the expense of consistent, um, consistent user-centric thinking and designing. However, we also need to make sure that there is a way for us to deal with it. And if we want to make sure that UX and Agile can really play in that good sandbox very, very well, we got to ensure that some compromises can be made as well. So some companies, where we're able to do this by doing this thing called Sprint Zero, where you do a lot of the upfront um, research strategy and initial designing, okay, even before the formal Sprint 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 happens, okay, you're really dealing with the hard stuff out of the way so that you can just devote that sprint cycle on the, on the features, the user stories, etc., etc. And if, uh, if you go on to bit.ly slash UX Jetpack, I have given you um, some resources in there about two companies here in Toronto that have a form of a, a Sprint Zero. One of them, okay, one of them has really been very, very big on Lean and Agile and their own Sprint Zero process, their own discovery process really leads towards user stories, which I think was a very interesting um, innovation. So definitely have a look at that. And so, Sprint Zero is really just meant to get that hard stuff out of the way. And I hope it's something that you would be able to consider whenever you have to, uh, whenever you have to work within an agile environment and, um, and have to just get this user-centered design thing um, on the road. So that's the first question. And now let's now move on to the second, which is now about the role of data in product design. So just a little gut check. Are we going too fast, too slow, just right, or anything? Pretty good? Okay. I'm kind of racing against Simon here because I do, um, do want to make sure that we still have time for, uh, for some interaction because there are some things that we do need to look into here. But we're going to let's, let's, let's move along over here. When we talk about data, when we talk about data, we're largely referring to all client side information that is used to understand your business's context. So, for example, we're talking about analytics, customer logs. CRM info, service calls, among many other things that your client has in terms of hard numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I want to show you uh, a diagram that I really, really liked. These are uh, some data sources and UX research methods at Canada Post, okay? Full disclosure, I don't work there. I tried, okay, but no dice, okay? I don't know if someone from Canada Post is here, but anyway. As you can see over here, 
there are two really striking things in this in this chart. The blue the blue boxes refer to largely qualitative uh, methods, whereas the orange boxes are more quantitative. And if you really look at the types of data sources and methods that they have, you'd probably notice that they're more interested in evaluating, assessing the performance of their products and services rather than understanding the problem at hand. Okay? So the character of the methods and the sources over here tends to be more evaluative than generative. Now, as a quick aside, just to make sure that our jargon and our definitions are really, uh, are really up to par, when we talk about generative, we're really talking about understanding the problem space, whereas evaluative is we're trying to prove or disprove hypotheses, we're measuring impact, etc., etc. And typically, evaluative research happens when there's already something out there on the road, and then generative is when, okay, we're trying to redesign something or we're trying to build something from scratch. From a web perspective, Generative research tends to be the flavor of fresh builds or redesigns, whereas if that thing is live already, it now skews towards evaluative. Okay? This is important because this will really tell you where Canada Post is already when it comes to their, um, their, um, their design processes. They've recently redesigned their website and their mobile apps. So it really makes sense that they're now trying to understand, okay, are we really achieving our targets, etc., etc. Contrast that with my own UX practice as an in-house practitioner or, as a, or as, a, as a consulting partner to some companies where, sure, I do have quantitative methods, for sure. I definitely look at analytics. I look at my competitors. I look at service logs. But then when you look at the blue, uh, the blue boxes here, you'll find that the qualitative methods in here are really more about, okay, um, who are the people that I'm really designing for? It's really more about that exploring the problem space, which is really um, emblematic of my own practice, which is because I'm helping clients really build something from the ground up or redesign something, my own research methods necessarily skew towards the generative side. But if I'm now really taking care of uh, a new website that's been launched out there, it does make sense that I will have to say, okay, I really need to make sure that the bounce rate is not over the, through the roof. Or else if my bounce rate is 80%, I should get fired, okay? Or something. I mean, whatever, but you know the truth, okay? So neither approach, generative or evaluative, neither of them is right or wrong, okay? But it points to the need to make sure that you are really contextualizing the research methods and data sources that you have according to the problem that you're trying to solve, according to the situation at hand. And the best way to really ensure that this is happening is to have a decent selection of quantitative and qualitative methods with you, mixed methods research, as they would say, to make sure that you've got a fulsome picture of, um, of, the, uh, of the issue at hand, of the problem that you're trying to solve. So that's number two, the role of data in product design, okay? And now I want to go through uh, the third, which is the role of accessibility in product design. I'm gonna make this simple, okay? I'm gonna make this simple. As designers, developers, strategists, researchers, creative technologists, whatever you call yourself, we have a big role in ensuring that the products and services that we build are, gonna be, are not going to be posing as a barrier to the people who use them. It's all part and parcel of being human, of being a good human, that is. And so our role is to make sure that the people who are dealing with our products and services are not feeling left out. Because I've noticed, especially when I, when I, was, reading, uh, when I was reading a Toronto Life article on someone who was uh, talking about her experience as a blind person in um, navigating the city of Toronto, she was really saying that the mere fact that someone seemed to have designed something that she can use felt like she was whole again. So notice what she just said over there. Because majority of the products and services that were built in this world were thought and conceived with an able-bodied person in mind, now that she has this challenge, 
she kind of felt left out. And we've got, uh, we've got a very special opportunity to make sure this doesn't, um, this doesn't become the case for someone like her. So here are some quick design wins that we can really look into to make sure that we are building the right and the most accessible products and services. And I'm just really going to zero in on that last point over here because this is where we designers tend to, uh, tend to really get very much carried away. So here's a footer, okay, here's a footer. And at first glance, there's nothing really like so bad about it. I would actually say that uh, with the exception of one thing, okay, the colors are pretty much on brand, on style, okay. But then the question is, how do you explain that about elephant right advertise menu? And so what I did was I ran it by a color contrast checker and it did say that it failed. And I should mention that one of the guilty things about us designers is that we sometimes prioritize aesthetics over functionality, which is this. And so this is like this periodic reminder for, for me and for my other colleagues that, you know, just because it really looks pretty, does it, just because you can put it as a dribble shot, okay, doesn't necessarily mean that you can actually get that thing on the road. And we still need to make sure that it's according to, according to standards, one of which is this, uh, this is color contrast thing. And the thing is, we can actually solve this. We can actually make sure that this doesn't become an issue and that we can, we can make this better whenever it shows up. So that's accessibility. And now we go on to the fourth and final point in here, which is that very, very common thing, which is, come on, Jem, research. Again, you're taking forever to do this thing. Why cannot you be faster? Okay. So there's a, common, there's a common concern I've noticed whenever I do my work that research is this, uh, is this bottleneck. It slows everything down. Um, uh, people cannot move forward because you're not done with your research or anything. And to me, there are really two sides to this issue. You've got the timeline problem, which, yeah, for sure, I concede. Some of us designers and researchers can just get so carried away with our understanding people that, uh, that, we, uh, that we just stockpile on those methods. But then the bigger problem, for me at least, is the relevance problem, which to me is the root of all the issues that research has in terms of really entrenching it in the product development process. Here's the truth. There's really this huge chasm between good UX research and organizational strategy. And I was really reminded of this the other week when I was talking to a I was talking to a director of uh, service design, and she was really, really hammering on the, uh, on, on the research methods that, that she had in her company. And sure, she was still able to talk about how this is relevant to her, um, to, to, her, to, her, to, her, to her boss, but I also thought about how my other colleagues approach UX research, and they just seem to say, oh, we did contextual inquiry, and then we did ethnography, then we did more user interviews and stuff. So it suddenly becomes this laundry list of all um, research methods and discovery techniques. But then the question then that we should be asking or, should, or like I should be asking myself is, well, what's in it for the company? So what if your personas were really the most dribble-worthy thing ever? What if it was really the most well-designed thing? What, if, what, what good is your statistically significant A-B test if, um, if um, we cannot really demonstrate that hard line, that connection between the insights that we've generated and how it's going to benefit the company. And so one way that I've tried to mitigate that challenge is to make sure that I always generate the oh moment when I share my UX research findings. And let me just give, share with you a story of how this actually worked. A couple of years ago, I was redesigning the website of the Canadian Jewish News. And, um, and at that time, I was still in the throes of the so-called persona placemat format, okay? which is really just that laundry list of uh, demographics and characteristics. But the moment my team started talking about UX research in terms of, well, you know, Janet really appreciates the recipes that you've got, and they look to the CJN to be this 
particular um, this particular thing. The moment we try to talk about our personas in terms of their relationship with the company, in terms of their emotional connection, and how important the CJN is to them, the moment we were able to establish that relationship, the more our client was saying, oh, tell me more about it. I really want to know. That is how we want our editorial strategy to be really going moving forward. We want to ensure that whatever we write is actually something that would be resonating with the people that we are writing for. So that kind of constant connection is what we really want to drive when it comes to doing effective UX research. Because really, Erica Hall, in a very recent but very, very um, well-argued article called Thinking in Triplicate, said in a very, very explicit way, Design is only as human-centered as the business model allows. What this means is, what this means is, everything that we do as designers and developers really happens within the purview of a business infrastructure. We wouldn't be able to do this job if, for example, you know, we wouldn't be able to do this job without that client, uh, you know, paying us. I mean, it's funny. I do know of a UX researcher that says that. Uh, all my behavioral inquiries are being bankrolled by us, by a big company that she works for. I mean, bankroll may sound like a very facetious term, but the truth of the matter is that only confirms the relationship that we have as workers, service workers, digital workers with the companies that we are working for. So the challenge then is not just to become user defenders alone, okay? We definitely need to make sure that we are representing the interests of our users. But we also need to make sure that in the process, we are not neglecting what our clients absolutely need. So it's that move from human-centered design to value-centered design, as Erica Hall says, that the biggest bang for design and research is what can really be generated. And that, I think, is a very, very worthwhile thing to work for. So far, so good. So to cap this conversation, we've talked about design discovery, a very, very quick um, overview of it and it is really this first mile in the UX slash product design process where we try to understand the customer and the business needs in order to build the right thing and consistent with the term jetpack we are not trying to stockpile way too much and make that you know that set of techniques too heavy and too bulky for us but we want to make sure that we start with something that we can work with and then scale it up according to what our project needs if you only have to remember one thing, I hope it's this. Good design is good problem solving. And considering that we are now in a day and age where design, where products and services are increasingly being fought at the experience level, it does make sense to make sure that UX research and design can be bought in and recruited to our camp. Think of this as you go, uh, go for work on Monday. Think of all the things that you will learn today and tomorrow at Drupal North. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have. Make sure that you represent your users and your business and go out there and build digital products that people love. Thank you. It's 4.30. So I don't know if I have time for questions. Um, uh, but uh, but let's uh, let's let's take a couple. Uh, let's, let's take a couple. Okay. If uh, uh, any 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 questions for any questions for me. I'm sure there are. <laughs> I mean, I was rapid firing over this. I don't know if my comprehension is is really, really spot on, but. Don't make me feel lonely here. <laughs> going once, going twice, going thrice. This is not an option, team. <laughs> None? Really? Yes, Suzanne. Oh, thank you, Suzanne. That means a lot coming from the dear leader of Evolving Web. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay. Um, so, how can I come up with a question as I'm talking to you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, we had a project recently. Do you have an example of a project where um, you, know, you, you had to really apply this? And, like, is there 
one example that like stands out to you where you had to come up with like a value? Yeah. Um, a couple of a couple of years ago, I was the user experience team of one, the sole UX practitioner at a not-for-profit organization. They were redesigning their website. It was a move from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7. So um, they were looking to me at that time to really just, okay, Jem, we really need to make sure that this information architecture for this particular um, uh, toolkit that we have can be a little bit leaner. So what I did there was to really do a lot of uh, heuristic evaluation and a lot of user testing. And what's actually funny in here was that I was still a, a very new practitioner at that, day, at that time. And I was saying, ah, I... I am the UX person in here. I have all the knowledge in the world, okay? Of course, younger, hubristic, and everything, okay? I said, I said, I initially said, oh, we should do, a, we should do advanced search in here. We should do advanced search. I was really coming up with all these, import, uh, these, these great um, mock-ups about how advanced search can be deployed. But then when I started doing user testing, when I started really understanding what, our, what the users of that particular, um, that particular not-for-profit service is, that's when, we started, that's when I started discovering, yeah, it's, advanced search is not going to work. It's all about making sure that the labels are clear, that, um, that there is a much leaner information structure to use, and that, um, and, that, um, and that it's not onerous to use, it can scale across devices. So that kind of shift from I am the genius designer all the way to okay, I actually have to respond to what, what my what my user tests has been showing. That is one example of how discovery processes can really um can really help you um, redirect uh, redirect um, uh, your project direction and also your design decisions. And I'm very happy to tell you that we were able to launch that. I mean, they've already redesigned their website yet again. But that following through on, on user insights and being able to respond to them and be able to tell my clients, this is what your, cli what your, what your customers need. And for them to really trust me with those recommendations, I think that's a really good thing. And it speaks to what really could happen if you have that close collaboration between yourself as a designer, as a developer, as a researcher, and the client that you're serving. Cool? All right. Thank you so much. I over rehearsed this thing so I kind of know what to say. There you go. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna pop in this real quick. Okay. So, just so you guys know, there's not, this is the end of the day. <laughs> uh, there's no big announcements or anything other than we hope to see you guys come back tomorrow. Uh, looking forward to it. Another big day, but it doesn't start until 10 a.m., so you get to sleep in. Um, and maybe be hung over after our after party, which is again at Rec Room. Make sure you guys get your gift certificates um, and let's head there ASAP because it's rush hour on a Friday. It's going to be a while. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Have a good one. <laughs>